Yeah. So, <coughs> so, thank you. Uh, I actually put my Julia backstory in the slide, so I'll start with that. Uh, first about me, uh, I'm a researcher at University College London. Uh, most of my stuff focuses on uh, well, a class of uh, uh, methods called Markov chain Monte Carlo, which is very heavily based, uh, but typically for computing uh, Bayesian statistical models, which is basically manipulating probability distribution. Uh, actually, most of my work is very theoretical. Uh, I do sort of theoretical analysis of computational techniques, but I do occasionally have to write code. Um, and typically, the code I do write is very sequential. Like, it's Markov chains, uh, a very sequential process. You can't vectorize them. Uh, and so, this was what originally drew me to Julia in some sense. Uh, basically, I wanted a language that is, well, firstly, quick to write. I don't want to have to you know, write a bunch of templates and um, stuff in C++ or whatever it's described. I just want to be able to patch something out and see, what, see how it works. Um, obviously, you want it to be fast, but more than that, you want it to be sort of representative of the speed that it would be if I was to actually implement it in some other you know, compiled language. So I don't want it to have some weird sort of bottleneck that's taking up all the time, but isn't actually representative of the speed of the algorithm. Uh, easy to understand, that was a nice thing. So, I write something in that notebook for six months. I'd like to be able to know what I was doing. Uh, but fundamentally, what I really like is being able to peek under the hood. Uh, and this is a, you know, the key problem with Python and R is that you know, there's this nice block of code, then they farm it out to some uh, incomprehensible C um, library, which you know, if you don't know C or even if you do sometimes, it's basically impossible to read. Debug you know, and um, as well. So how I met Julia, uh, September 2012, Justin Donkey had a uh, blog post where he tried out a few algorithms. And this uh, you know, Justin ever write another Max file was his uh, sort of argument. And he had a couple of benchmarks, and one of them was an MCMC one, where basically he got in roughly all the magnitude of C, whereas Python and uh, Matt, uh, sorry, R and MATLAB were back with, you know, several orders of magnitude out of um, out. Uh, and at the time, I had MATLAB code for things like this, where I was working with positive definite matrices. I wanted to, um, and I had to keep sort of solving these, um, keep solving a bunch of systems. And so what I was doing is writing Kolesky factors and then you know, doing a bunch of different things, uh, doing a bunch of divisions, because that tend to be slightly quicker than just doing a matrix division. Uh, and then, you know, some, for some reason, the fact that this, this really, uh, you know, one of those great ideas, you know, that, that makes so much sense, is that you can just create a velocity factor, pretend it's an object, um, treat that as an object, and then you know, that acts like a matrix. Uh, it's a very elegant way of doing it. And I remember, uh, I remember the, the matrix package in R, which uh, of course don't have a good hand in, um, and tried to use, but, but never, you know, I was never really get uh, the rest of R up to speed as to be the feasible approach. So once, you know, I liked it, I thought, great idea. Um, and then, funnily enough, I found a bug in computing the determinant, and then that was my first pull request series later. Uh, so, where I'm going from here. Uh, so as I said, distributions are fun. Um, I'm going to talk about the distribution library. Uh, it's basically, as I said, a, probably, uh, a whole library dedicated to working with probability distribution. Um, and it's also one of the oldest Julia packages. Um, I looked it up, it's the fifth package we added to the metadata. Um, and it basically just started as a wrapper for a bunch of, um, for the ARMF libraries, which is essentially uh, mathematical genes, LIR, um, LIR. It's got 568 commits, um, and there's been 27 people who to it. Um, the main ones being, um, well, in someone in order, Tahua, John, Douglas, and Andreas. Um, I'm somewhere in the middle. Maybe at the end there. So I haven't actually, I've done some, but uh, others have certainly done more than me, so don't take my uh, this talk as a uh, new entry in these um, And the idea is to get it sort of under a permissive license. Uh, well, that's the aim. I can't wait quite there yet because of the GPL dependency on Arma. Uh, and it's very, actually, as a structure, it's fairly simple. We have the distribution is the abstract type, um, and it's parametric. There's two parameters, uh, univariate is the one that specifies how many, so it's the univariate, it's a single variable, 
It's also a multivariate, a matrix variate, different uh, cases. And continuous, whether it's continuous means it takes uh, values of the real line, discrete, it takes values of integers, etc. Um, so gamma being a univariate continuous distribution. And things act on that quite nicely. Uh, and this is very nice uh, for some reason. It's a consistent interface. Uh, so we've never, as in somewhat intermittent R uh, user, of currently forgetting which was the uh, you know D getting my P D gamma and P gamma confused. Um, and then also the order of the arguments for those. Um, so it avoids having to remember for function prefixes and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so what's very useful is you can capitalize gamma uh, as a type, so you get this very you know, language that seems to be a common problem that you have a gamma function and a gamma distribution. Uh, and finally, Do the we fact have beta that beta Sorry? Do we have the beta function? Yeah. There is, but I have a problem with that. It's a, <laughs> uh, immutable types means this uh, basically yeah, you avoid the overhead of having to explicitly create destroy objects that would you know, occur if you're trying to do something for Python. Um, and what's nice, and so very simply, if you just want the properties of a distribution, the mean or variance, ketosis, you just apply to the distribution object. Um, so mean is the same mean, so you just overload the mean function, that's not looking at You apply to a sample. Uh, functions then just take the distribution and the extra argument. So a PDF, you just apply on the distribution at that point. Um, and CDF, which is the cumulative, the cumulative, uh, cumulative probability, uh, is that same at that point. Uh, and then we copy the, we uh, use the R approach also of having a complementary function. So CCDF is the one minus the CDF. Uh, reason B, um, this is. Uh, so small that when you take one minus it, it would be, it, uh, it basically uh, truncates off when we, we would lose the value. And we also include uh, low precision functions, uh, for, which can be very, uh, well, is another way of uh, including extra precision in these uh, extreme tables, and also very useful for what I do, which is uh, when you're dealing with high, high uh, density things, you start, start multiplying these things together to work on space. Uh, then we also overload RAND for sampling, so RAND binomial gives you a binomial, uh, or a more extra argument that gives you that number of samples. Very straightforward, very, very simple structure actually. And we also include some things for fitting these such distributions. Um, so for example, fit MLE, <coughs> fit uses a maximum likelihood estimator. So we take 1,000 samples from a gamma 3.5, and you want to fit a gamma to those samples. Gives us, as you would hope, something very close to a gamma 3.5. So that's the uh, much of the that's basically the high level interaction of the uh, distribution package. Could could you fix the shape and fit the scale there, for example? Not yet. That's what we're. Uh, it's a. Uh, this is a work in progress still. So okay. that's that's one of the things we're um, Yeah. So constrained families and subfamilies. And that's all. Sort of thing. So still work. I mean, part of it is the problem is that, and this is a slight thing. So a gamma. The concrete type, so gamma 3.5 is a specific distribution. And gamma, the object, um, so we're also treating then gamma the, when it's not a, the, sort of the type itself, not the actual the object of that type. Should that then be a family of those distributions? Um, and I guess in a certain sense, yes, because that's how we deal with our real, you know, for example, float 64 is an abstraction of the reals, and so it's meant to represent the set of uh, the set of all uh, to four numbers. So, in that sense, we probably should do it that. So then we need to wait to construct these and so on. That's a question we still want to figure out. Uh, so I'll give us sort of some examples of how we use it, how it can be used. Uh, and this is a nice, elegant one, I think. Um, so kernel density estimation. So it's basically a way of, uh, so it's a method of estimating a probability density function from a sample. Uh, it's fairly simple. What you do is you have a kernel, which is uh, typically a probability, which is another probability distribution, which is a very, which is very tightly um, bound around a particular point. And you just sort of smooth. So you, it, it's, a, it's basically the weighted sum. It's a sum of a bunch of kernels about the, about the sample point. Um, typically, we take it to be symmetric, um, and centered at zero, so then we should be shifted around the real line. And it's fairly simple to work with. We uh, so so a very simple naive uh, implementation would be something like this: we uh, take a sample at n points, so we 
We had a group of endpoints. Uh, we fit some. Uh, we then just for each then for each observation, we just accumulate the uh, the sample, accumulate the PDF around that point, uh, which was divided by n there at some point. Should we break my code priorities? Um, and that were you know that's a fairly straightforward um, computation using the different distributions. Um, so we can change the kernel just by changing it from get. Um, so uh, not actually a great way of doing it because it requires n times n operations. So how it's actually done in practice, uh, well, is by what well, we are, are actually using convolving and empirical density being the tabulated values with that of the kernel. Uh, so if it's full of convolutions, then you sort of wind up using Fourier transforms. Uh, so that easy, so a somewhat more efficient way uh, is that you tabulate the data to the grid that takes n operations. Um, simply, so you just compare your, um, it's an order one operation to tabulate a single data point, so for each, and each uh, data point, and one, one, uh, one operation. Uh, then you compute the FFT, the very transform of that, of the tabulated data, and then we can convolve by the Fourier transform of the kernel. Um, but we don't actually need to compute that Fourier transform because we have that already as part of the distribution package. This is the characteristic function of the probability distribution, which NLE is just the CF, which is called CF. Uh, and so that's how, it, and that just then requires order M operations, and then we do the inverse FFT, which gives us the operations. So it's a somewhat more efficient way of doing it. And this has the extra be uh, benefit of being able to reuse the tape, this uh, original table multiple times, because typically you're not just fitting one, FF, typically you don't just want to fit one, uh, uh, one band, one KDE, you might want to vary the bandwidth to see, sort of look for the optimal or do some sort of cross validation. And so at the moment, some of that functionality is implemented in this package kernel density. Uh, so this is basically uh, something I wrote relatively recently uh, and is available in the metadata. It's basically, yeah, so using the kernel density, I include a bunch of books to various plotting packages, um, and then you plot the so you can plot KDEX returns a KDE kernel density object on the data, and then that returns it, and then you just plot that. Is that using Winston? Yeah, this is using Winston. Um, so I think Gadfly include has sort of revert, so it does it itself, whereas I think Winston and uh, one of the one I included wrote some sort of funny books to try and book in the package to change the package. Uh, so it's a bit of a hack, but it kind of works quite well. Um, but also, we can alter uh, the you can change that kernel by just plugging in the uniform, um, by choosing a different family distribution, so in this case uniform, and you can see sort of now rather than having a nice smooth structure, we've got a very step function. Each kernel is a um, is a uniform, so it's a, uniform, so it's a sum of uniform kernels which are at this block shape. Um, and then you can plug in other distributions there, or you can specify a specific distribution if you don't want to automatically figure out the uh, better. Uh, so I'll somewhat live there, I'd say examples, that's just one example I guess, uh, but I will, I want to sort of talk about what's actually happening, so it's still very much a work in progress, um, and a big part of that is replacing, getting rid of the RMAP dependency. Um, so I'll give a, so RMAP is a, as I said, it's a C library, the library of numerical serial genes that underlie all the special functions in R. Um, and it is possible, I guess, possibly the most widely used library of such functions. And it's been accumulated over 15 odd years and has seen a lot of extensive use. So it is actually fairly and remarkably efficient. So although R cops a lot of flack, their actual numerical team is uh, fairly good. Um, and as I said, it provides these log space functions for extreme tails, which not many other libraries uh, provide, which can be very useful in certain circumstances. Um, and they tend to be fairly reliable and have done a lot of checking over various domains to check if they work. Um, particularly these incomplete gamma and beta functions and uh, all these funny ones which uh, often people sort of over the However, being GPL, we can't just translate the C code to Julia because uh, for licensing reasons. So there's also a lot of other sources of these, uh, some other sources of these routines. Um, Possibly the best named one is the Naval Surface Warfare Center's library. Um, it's accumulated for Fortran 77 library. Uh, I once went for a job in, a, in, the, in the Australian equivalent of the, uh, uh, the, Naval, uh, the Naval Warfare Division, just on the uh, 
purely on the basis of the business card. <laughs> so, yeah, that's kind of sort of um, there's a Cepheres library which is maintained by a guy at uh, National Labs, which one. Um, of course, Boost now is becoming much more much popular. It's the C++ template library, uh, which can be good. And I'll sort of explain where it's got some very good things, but some very strict, bad things I'm trying to show you. Uh, and SciPy has improved a lot recently, and just again, it's your Python and C mostly. Um, otherwise, it means deciphering a lot of journal appendices, which can be a collection of obscure full tree routines, um, pseudocode, or other things. Uh, and so I end up finding some very interesting articles. And the, the best one is the uh, one of the, one of the, so it's journal of, uh, basically it ends up referring to the um, addenda, the, it's like a third or fourth order addendum than that. So there's a, the original article, then someone made a comment, and there's an addendum to the comment, and I think there's one extra one. So you have to end up chasing through all these references to find out which is the actual correction. And of course, it's all in one place. You have to go start the first one, and then add and remove all these separate bits. So uh, it's not an easy job. Um, and of course, if the license status is often not clear, and ACM is particularly bad here, because they claim copyright on everything, even if they can't. So. <laughs> <laughs> They have to be very careful. Okay. Um, and so Donald Muth made a comment that code doesn't, you know, go stale or anything. But you do notice that one particular problem with numeric code is that, especially if it predates the IEEE floating point standard, um, there's a lot of hacks in there to try and make it behave nicely. So uh, this was, of course, this gave us several nice things. Mainly, particularly being exact round nearest arithmetic uh, and gradual underflow, which very important in some cases. And so especially this uh, in this WC library, you see lots of things like 0.5 plus 0.5 minus P, where they're trying to keep that extra bit, trying to avoid these uh, bit bits disappearing, which we don't have don't a call now. now. Uh, nice, uh, this is the was, was that to keep the guard people? Yeah, I, I assume so, because that's, um, I mean, these were written in the, you know, pre the uh, DEC machines, I assume. Um, and they very rarely they actually include any concrete floating point error analysis. So you, really don't know how accurate they can be. Um, and they often are OK for reasonable values, so values you would typically use, which is OK for an application. But when you're trying to write a library, you want it to be, you know, there's, always some, there's always someone who's going to push it to the extreme. So you want to try and keep it um, so it operates well. Uh, well um, and these things can be remarkably tricky. So I've talked about incomplete gamma functions and various things. But even simple Poisson densities, that can be, if you can miss that, it can be remarkably complicated in the system. Um, so obviously, there's a naive version. You take lambda times the power of x times e to the lambda, divided by x factorial. Um, but as soon as you choose lambda and x to be sort of even in tens, this thing is going to overflow very quickly. Um, so you have to be very careful. Uh, or if lambda is very small, it can quickly underflow, and you get sort of weird. So you have to be somewhat careful with this. Uh, so the obvious trick is then to rewrite this as this. So you take the um, lambda in the power, and you have ex being times x times log lambda minus lambda, uh, which will typically be much uh, work over a much greater range. But now we have a sort of a, we start getting sort of numeric problems arising. So these are both going to be positive. Typically, both be positive numbers if lambda is greater than one. They're also going to be a roughly similar magnitude. Uh, so what's going to happen is we're going to have some numerical error when we, rounding error when we compute log lambda times x. Uh, then we subtract a number which is roughly the same size as it, and so that relative error we have then accumulates massively. So it goes from being sort of quarter um, two units of relative error to much larger, so 100. And then we take an exponent of that, that then accumulates a different number. Uh, so you have to be sort of trying to uh, so there's a neat trick <coughs> is this idea of, so we take, so what I'm actually working at the moment is, well, one way of doing this is you take Sterling's, um, is, uh, sort of a take, so you ever seen Sterling's uh, asymptotic approximation of the gamma function? Uh, so asymptotic approximation is one of those great tools which can be scary but great at the same time. Uh, so when x gets, as x gets larger, this uh, expression gets much closer, gets closer and closer and closer uh, to x factorial. So, and it's an asymptotic approximation. Uh, I give 
has to be very interesting in the sense that as we take more and more terms of the series, um, it gets better and better and better, and then suddenly it starts getting worse and worse and worse and worse. So you have to find, and the point at which it gets better uh, you know, changes as x gets larger. So as x gets larger, we, we get closer, but you know, it's one of these very strange things. You have to find a good place to truncate it and only work for certain x's. Um, but it does allow us to rewrite this as this. So a bit of rearrangement. We have this, uh, so we have xp times x times this guy, which I'll explain in a second, minus this um, sterling adjustment <coughs> divided by root t2 by x. Uh, so a couple of things. So log of xp1 is just log of x minus x plus 1. Um, so if you quickly do that in your head, you can figure that that's always going to be negative. Uh, where we're subtracting this, which will always be positive. So the sum of two negative numbers will always be negative. So we're not no longer going to have this cancellation property. And so this thing is somewhat more uh, stay much more accurate. Um, and typically, for this, this is a for x greater than 10. This series tends to be we can this to less than two ops, which is ops. So I'll use a bit more later. It means units in last place, which is essentially if you ever use eps of a particular value, it's the multiples of that that are accumulating. So it's the difference between two, two, two consecutive, it's the space between two consecutive floating point numbers. Um, as I said, both terms are the same sign, so we don't get this huge explosion of relative error. And um, as a bonus, we don't have to get a function, which is always good. Um, of course, this is not the only way to do it. R uses a slightly different formulation. Um, rather than log of x plus 1, they basically bring the lambda out the front instead of the x, so they get a slightly different thing. Um, and then boost, boost uses a completely different method based on a land choice approximation of the gamma function, but even, even stranger than the approximation of the um, so what about this log of xp1? Uh, this is an interesting story. Turns out, at the moment, we have a bunch of these extra utility functions that we have. Um, at the moment, just variance of log, we have all these things. So it's basically the different, um, so rather than having all just basically variance of lo uh, logs that we need that would otherwise uh, cause problems, we would just implement them straight now and just use the naive version. Um, Typically, you get some sort of numerical instability. So a lot of these ones will underflow or overflow very, easy, um, very easily. So if you're taking an exponent, which gets very big, then you're doing some minor adjustment and then logging and then taking a log. So you, uh, we need to be able to sort of uh, those ones. Um, and then these last two, uh, basically, we get catastrophic cancellation, which I'll explain. Um, so we'll split this guy log, log one here. So this is a slight variant of the other one I mentioned earlier. So how it rises is, um, so you have your log 1 plus x, Taylor series of log 1 plus x looks something like this. Um, and that converges for x, um, absolute values of x less than 1. So for small values of x, uh, so for very small values of x, as x gets closer and closer to 0, this becomes roughly x. All these extra terms disappear. Uh, and this is why we have the log 1p function. All MATLAB functions have this. So if we take log 1 plus some very small number, it, you know, this um, 1 plus 1 in maybe 20 is just 1, log 1 is 0. Um, so they include this log 1p function, which is basically x. So it does the same thing. And so log 1 pmx is the same thing, but to the next order, basically. So we have log 1 plus x, and then minus x is basically the next term, which is minus x squared over 2. Uh, and so if we were to do the same thing, log 1 px minus x um, at x 1 in negative 20, Zero. Uh, whereas if you do this in big float arithmetic, you can see it's basically <coughs> it is uh, this minus x squared over two. Uh, and so again, this is another um, example of catastrophic cancellation. So what's happening is we're just we're losing all the bits of stuff when we do the subtraction. Um, so how bad is this? So this is a plot of relative error in ALPS. So keep in mind why why is a log scale. Um, so typically, if you look at uh, LibM functions which underlie uh, using open LibM, they typically, most, all of them are accurate to uh, one op, so nearly all of them are accurate to about there. Um, and then, even on this sample I use, they quickly get blow up to 10,000, you know, out by 10,000, so it's uh, four or five decimal places. And if we get closer and closer to zero, that'll be even more, so it's just on this uh, domain I was looking at. So, but actually, it's typically, so it's typically reasonable for all values outside that value of negative one one. So anything greater than one, we're fine, basically. We're within, um, we're just over an op, so it's 
So uh, this is log one PMA. So this is the same one. Uh, so how can we do this? So I went. So you start looking at what people use. Um, turns out, if you uh, it took me a while to figure out how it worked, but Boost basically just uses a naive series summation. So they start at that series and just keep adding terms until it stops. Um, and if you do that, it works in the sense of we get relative error. So our highest relative error is about 12 hours over that range. So just the range maybe 1 1 now. Um, and so it does work. The problem is that series converges incredibly slowly. Um, at 0.95, it requires 618 terms to do that, to compute that whole thing. Um, and it also requires, at each iteration, you need to then check if it's even there. Thing, so you have this you know, frequent branch compilers uh, 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 Okay, so the next trick is we do some sort of nice uh, sum up. So you do some sort of substitution. Um, so if you look in the log one p function, what they do is this r equals x over x plus two. In fact, this is a fairly common trick in all sorts of log one p functions. It's been around for a long time, really. Um, and so what happens is we now have. So this is roughly the size, well this is roughly half x, so it's now a little bit smaller, which is good because it now gets closer to it. Uh, it's quicker. Plus it only includes all terms, so it's, the series will be half the length. Um, half as many terms, one extra benefit, they're all going to be at the same sign, which means, um, I didn't so mention previously, but if you have alternating signs, you accrue extra cancellation error, so that reduces that. Um, and we can, so I just talked about log 1 plus x here, with a bit of fiddling around, you can expression for the log 1 pmx. And this is what Armour uses uh, internally. For small values, um, so basically for very small values, 0 .0, less than 0 0.01, you can just compute this using a Horner expansion, and we know it convert, you can show that it converted in about seven or uh, six or seven terms. Um, and then what it does for other values less than one, it turns into continued fraction and then has an introduced scheme. And so continued fractions are a much better way to do that than that sort of naive series expansion tool. The, uh, the naive series expansion tool better. Uh, and that works quite well. So they get this, they get less than 10. Um, so 10 is in the last place. And sort of but most of it's within you know, less than three. Okay, so that's not so bad. Time. So this NSWC function library. Uh, so it includes, well, actually includes a negative of it, but it has some very, it has, a, so this was written by some guys at, uh, yeah, so these NSWC, um, the, but these are sort of the old school uh, numeric analysts, which don't seem to be, very few seem to be around anymore. But um, there really doesn't seem many people driving this, doing this stuff anymore, I guess because they think it's all done. But it turns out it's a lot of interesting things uh, you can do. So basically, what they do is they take the first few series of that um, expansion, and then they do some sort of rational approximation to the rest. Uh, I won't go up there. But then we can also do what's called a range reduction. So what is it? Once we're out, so if we're around zero, we do this. If we're not around zero, we just shift, we can um, compute, we can compute this u, and then we can compute log um, one x plus minus x in terms of those two expressions there. Um, so we just need to be able to compute that. So this is, so typically we just do this for a few different values of alpha, so we can compute all that in advance. So we only need to compute this guy on the fly and this alpha. Um, and that works reasonably well. Um, so they're going to be a bit better than the um, arm one. So down there, down about five volts or so. Okay. I'll just, as good as it is, we can still improve. So as I said before, um, IEEE arithmetic is always a good idea. So firstly, the rational approximation turns out to be unnecessary. Um, if you took tricks, which turns that series of converges in Floyd 64, I think that's because they're using massive significance or quite short. Operating, I think they are uh, using yeah, this was pre some massive uh, floating point. Um, also, we can exploit all these uh, exact type, um, floating point operations. Uh, so, there's a couple of these. So, the standard one, if you look through the uh, Goldberg paper about everything you need to know, they mentioned that if you subtract uh, two numbers of the same magnitude, well, with the same uh, exponent, then uh, that would be a uh, factor of two, then you get uh, an exact operation. Yeah, they don't have to have the same exponent, they just have to be. Well, that factor too. Yeah, exactly. So there's a bunch of, but you can extend these to, there's a, there's a lot of other tricks you can play. So if you can actually subtract them, you can subtract numbers in certain ways. Well, firstly, if you multiply things by powers of two, then we're okay, which is good because we have that x squared over two. So we're, um, so the leading term only accumulates one, uh, one rounding operation. 
But we can also, there's also a bunch of other tricks you can play. When you subtract things, you get zeros at the end, and so when you do multiplications, you don't. You multiply by numbers that are very, you know, multiple, you know, 1.5, you know the last few bits of zeros, then you can stay within the, uh, getting maintain exact operation. So playing a few of those tricks, we can manage to get the whole thing down to less than two hours, which is a quick thing. And it doesn't, it's all deterministic in the sense that it doesn't require these tests. There's no branching other than these, uh, the range reductions. So, I was very happy with that, um, and it seems to be actually quicker you know, quite quicker than the RMAP code, so I'm quite happy with that. Um, of course, that's just one utility function. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a lot of time spent for a function that isn't actually exported at all. Um, <laughs> so the unique ones are these incomplete gamma functions, and the problem with these is that unlike that Poisson thing I talked about earlier, we don't, um, we can't just you know, plug it into, uh, so we have to actually write, you know, I can do those in, compute those in big float and then just compare what I was getting. Um, so, we actually, so to actually compute these, we have to also compute these in big float as well to check that we're getting these values. And even more difficult than that, we've got this incomplete beta function, which is sort of, there's at least four or five, I think I've come across four different published papers on the incomplete gamma function. There's only one on the beta function, and that's by the NSWC guys, so it's a, that's going to be a um, And then, of course, we need the inverse of these, and then you've got the really fun numbers, the non-central ones, which is, um, so, a lot to do. Uh, there's a bunch of different, I'll just mention briefly sampling. Um, so this is the other thing, which is somewhat more actually, because the, uh, there's a lot of different ways to sample random numbers. Um, so if you're sampling from a binomial distribution, there's the trivial way where you just uh, you know, sample a bunch of Bernoulli variables and then sum them up. Uh, the problem is that as n gets large, that becomes quickly feasible, takes a long time. But what we can do for very small large probabilities, we can do sample geometric variables. And that, so rather than having to compute, uh, take n samples, we now have to only take n p samples, which is always a good thing. Uh, well, then what you can do is once you get, uh, once, you know, uh, by appealing the central limit theorem, once it starts looking roughly normal, you can use uh, normal approximations and then plug in a bunch of corrections, basically rejection, various rejection samples, and you get a, uh, you get the exact. So that's what. I just did recently, and uh, once we tune the model, we can turn it on. Um, and the other thing is that we can also reuse, and I guess this is more important, is often you, well, in some cases you only want one sample distribution, but often you want, you know, 10,000 or a million samples. Um, and so things like, especially this normal approximation requires being a bunch of constants uh, for taking a sample. So you don't want to have to compute those each time. Um, and if you look at R math, it actually ends up using a bunch of global variables, this, uh, which is not really thread, which is not thread safe. So if you're running you know, trying to run this on two different uh, threads, what's going to happen is that you can get some weird interaction and then uh, you, know, you might not get any samples. And I don't know how on a primitive big debug you're, you're ever going to, you know, even, so it might happen, but you're never actually going to be able to debug that because debugging your number generators is not fun. Uh, so anyway, basically what we end up doing is defining sampler types which then sample from those distributions and then have some sort of poly algorithm which they will then select the appropriate sample based on the range. Um, okay, I've got a few minutes, don't I? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Uh, I'll just give a quick overview of what we're, some future ideas, other than all that stuff I said, so I'll do it. So, truncated parametric, um, so we can do, you know, have some fun with the uh, parametric type system. So, one is the <coughs> truncated, so at the moment we have this truncated type. So a truncated distribution is basically, imagine taking a bunch of samples from a normal distribution and then throwing away all the ones outside some range. So that gives you a truncated distribution. And for those who are curious, that's completely different than a sensor distribution. So it's always something to keep in mind. Statisticians are very picky about that. So keep that in mind, right? So the other one is a sensor distribution, which is when you uh, threshold. So basically I've thrown away all the values here. You can also, if you sensor it, you then threshold, which would mean that you would get any values in this tail would be at that value. So that's a, they're two different classes. We haven't got the other sensor one yet, but that's a on the list. You have to normalize. Uh, so you have to normalize a truncated one, but you don't have to normalize a sensor one. So you normalize this because we throw them away, so it's as if those values never occur. So you have to equate the sensor one, you would, the ones out here would actually just then be thresholded, so then be taken back to this value. People don't call that the conditional distribution? Yeah, so this is the conditional distribution, conditional on this input, yes. But the, t the term we usually use is that it's not truncated um, for various reasons. And so what we can do is we have this truncated type. So a truncated normal zero one, we truncate it to 
lower, lower value is minus two, the upper value is one. So this is just now a parametric type with truncated, which then this parameter is this normal. Um, and so what's nice is that we can then, well, firstly, we can define just functions that then operate on the truncated type. Uh, so in this case, uh, the PDF, well, what it does is it takes the PDF and then renormalizes it as we go. Um, but you can also then do other nice, uh, so in certain cases, especially for the normal distribution, we know that the, um, we can actually, if we haven't done yet, it's said, it's the future work. You have different methods for different, so certain distributions, truncate, uh, the truncation is very easy to compute straight, uh, in a straightforward manner. So the obvious one being the exponential distribution, if you truncate an exponential distribution, it's got the memoryless, pro memoryless property such that you just reshape it, you just got to shift it. Um, and so we can apply this trick to all sorts of other things. So an obvious one would be sort of monotonic transformations. And if you look through the list of distributions in SciPy, a lot of them are just basically um, various transformations of other distributions. So um, what we could do is define a transform this parameter type, which takes a univariate distribution, and also a um, object f functor, where functor is basically it's higher representing a function. Uh, this numeric function pack package. Right? Uh, and then you use three derived methods from that. So if you simulate a random variable, you would just sample, a sample from the distribution D and then apply the function to it. If you want to compute the CDF, um, you would evaluate the inverse of the function at that point and then compute the CDF of the distribution, etc. And PDF, you do the same thing, except then you have the correction for the Jacobian term. So all this stuff you could just do with meta methods. You Actually, implement for every single distribution. But, but it's not obvious how to get to randomly sample from the truncated distribution, right? Uh, no. It's, so, in some cases, you just want a rejection sample. In some cases, you want to, you know, have to derive. So, but the nice thing about it is because um, it's a parametric type for specific distributions, if you know there's a very elegant way to do it, you can then just define it for that distribution and not, you know, to, and then you can have fallbacks to rejection sample for every one for the rest. Um, so a few other things, I'll leave that for the time being. One thing I've been thinking about, um, I had to work with a Hilbert space on there. Uh, so distributions define Hilbert space, uh, define a, a inner product of, uh, of functions. So what you can do is construct orthogonal polynomials, um, and these orthogonal polynomials give us a way to compute, um, well, essentially, um, you've got, they give you a basis, well, some sort of basis of, uh, of, of a function space. And then using that, we can compute quadrature rules, which can evaluate numerical integrals by uh, numerically by evaluating a function to find a number of points. Uh, so we could work that somehow into computing expectations. <coughs> I'll leave that for your own thoughts. Uh, and lots more, all that stuff. Uh, my own particular favorite is implementing distributions on non-Euclidean spaces. Uh, that's my aim at some point. Uh, particularly these steeple manifolds, low orientations. Uh, anyway. Final thoughts. So basically, playing with this has been a great way to learn a lot of numerical analysis. Um, yeah, stuff I sort of like, fell asleep in lectures and then you actually start playing around this on the screen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you learn stuff that's, you know, uh, and yeah, you do learn a lot about how numerical, um, sort of the underlying, how floating point operations work, um, and how good the arbitrary standard is, and sort of stuff. Um, so some things we mentioned, I guess we mentioned earlier, um, float 80, float, float points, so high precision, standard precision arithmetic. Um, this is particularly useful for some of those functions, uh, and it's probably something that's worth thinking about. The problem is, as we said, that it does not consistent across platforms and all those sorts of things. Uh, but it also comes to ultimately the decision how accurate these functions should be and what's, how much time should we spend. Uh, and one thing that was particularly for multivariate distributions is something for a convenient consistent syntax for in-place operations. At the moment, with all these exclamation mark operations, which are getting a bit uh, unwieldy. I mean, often you, you, know, you avoid, you just, you can't use nice arithmetic operations if you're trying to do everything else. So, uh, that's it. MXP1 is fairly easy just to derive for that. Should we have some of those more crazy functions in base and export them? I mean, I mean, they're not going to be something that a lot of people 
necessarily use, but they're really, really useful when you're trying to write other code, library code that's going to be so, across. And that's, I mean, so, so what I was going to say about the beta function um, is that currently we have we do the beta function isn't really, a, you know, it's computed by taking log gamma functions and exponents. So we actually, you know, you can create weird edge cases where it actually is, you know, off by several, you know, five or six digits. So it's perhaps worth looking at. That might be something. Um, that would require implementing one of the, you know, all these crazy, you know, you know yeah, they have the yeah, system. Yeah. These libraries have various functions. Yeah. Are those in just defined distribution? Um, not yet. We haven't yet. They're still uh, very much work progress. You need that nearly surface overlap. Yeah, we're still. It's a matter of trying. As I said, it's got some good ideas, but you can't <coughs> translate directly because it's right. so like the code is was written for different machines and written for you know this, these funny significance. It doesn't have all these nice, it doesn't take any nice things. And often just threshold is randomly randomly to avoid these uh, underflow machines. There's a question. Yeah. Uh, this is the kind of thing I drew a uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, and I, I started reading the code for the distribution uh, package, and the very first thing that jumped in my to me was the very first few lines. I think is that you you guys forgot the, or you didn't think about the, the 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 distributions that are not discrete, nor continuous. There's a whole bunch of them. Oh yeah, yeah. right. So, and I'm not, I'm not saying there's, a, you know, there's some parametric uh, model that I'm really interested about and that is like that, but it's one thing that, that, that needs to be in there. If you, if you do, for example, the, the censoring or some other mm. operation on those uh, distributions, you're going to get something that's not going to be, yeah, that, that you would want to be a distribution, exactly. it's neither. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, we haven't figured out what we're going to do about those. Yes, but we certainly do need to make censoring, obviously. Um, sort of compound for some process as well. Yeah. Give you and mixtures. Mixtures, mixtures, yeah. Yeah. We're open to suggestions. Can you tell us about exponential families? Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so basically, an exponential family has a density function of this form. Uh, so it's basically, some function of the x, which is more typically is a reference measure, you could say. Um, then you have, it's written as a, um, an x times an inner product of the function of the x and the function of the thetas, and then just the a theta is just the normalization constant you would need over the thetas. Um, and so this sx is called a sufficient statistic. Um, basically, it contains all the information about x, uh, about theta from x that is contained that you can get from sample. Um, and it's also linear in the sense that we can summarize it for, we have a set of uh, observations. Independent observations, I should say. That all that's all the information we just take by summing up. So it's a nice thing. Um, and so what we have at the moment is a bunch of substats function methods, which will then, for each distribution, manually all these loops that pull out the uh, different things. So for example, gamma, you have a, a the sx is an x and a log x, and then for normal, it's an x and x squared. Well, actually, it's a mean and variance type thing. Um, and so we define all this manually, but it's so actually, if you look at some of these things, and this is like two thirds of the code in the for a particular distribution with all the other methods. You know, I've written nice one or two lines, whereas these end up being huge complicated iterations. So it seems like it's like prime for a meta programming trickery and just did implement this stuff. Um, so in this case, x is an array or something, and s is so a often, scalar or a tuple? Uh, so x1 to xn are individual. Uh, uh, so I imagine the substats of gamma come at x. So yeah, this x would be a vector. Substats would typically then be a well, two or or something. They would give you a type, which would be two or three. All right. Well, I think we'll have we're, we're running yep. behind, so maybe we take.